Welcome to Dhaka, Bangladesh, and to, I'm going to read it, the fifth international conference on community-based adaptation to climate change. And I've got with me one of the uh, organizers of the conference, and who is? Atik Rahman, Executive Director of Bangladesh Center for Advanced Studies. Uh, one of the two organizations yeah. that know yeah, it. Along with International News for Environment Development, we are organizing this meeting. Okay, let's get straight into adaptation. Do you think it's fair to say that with, adapt with uh, clim international climate negotiations uh, seem to be stalled, or at least going very slowly, there is a new focus on adaptation? Yes, uh, adaptation is the human response. Well, the response will be by many. The ecosystem will respond. The human communities will respond. Institutions will respond. Market will respond. So there are many responses. But it's the human response, particularly to the challenges of climate change impacts. That's what we have been trying to address in this case. The human communities, those who are responding most, are forced to respond, are the ordinary people living their ordinary lives, particularly the poor who are most impacted by the effects and the you know, various manifestations of climate change. If it's floods in China or Pakistan or Bangladesh or you know, Sri Lanka, drought in uh, Mali or you know, even in China, um, India, all that is felt by ordinary people and they are trying to adjust and take a, you know, do the best they can under a very given circumstances. Something they understand, something they don't, but they have to respond. They're not waiting for some negotiation to complete and somebody to throw some money at them and do it. So the poor of the world are adapting to the stress and the complexities caused by the rich of the world. Mm -hmm. And that is one of the historical tragedies. Now, obviously, uh, the climate negotiation is basically, you know, if not collapsing, uh, it's going so slow that it doesn't mean, mean much for the poor. And at every juncture, the rich have passed the buck and to the poor, and the poor have just to carry on with their lives. Sometimes they understand what's going on, sometimes they don't. And what we are trying to do here is to try and understand what is the science behind the adaptation that is going on? Should it be random adaptation? Should it be planned? If we don't plan it now, then the planetary process of economic growth, of survival, of crop distribution, of food security, of water security, of energy security would be in such a threat that we will not be able to come out of that problem. But, but let me ask you, there were several speakers today who mentioned the, the, the knowledge and experience and wisdom that local people in many parts of the world have on this issue. They're, they're the first in line to suffer the consequences, but many of them, as you say, are responding already. They have to respond, otherwise they die or they lose yeah. their livelihoods. So do you think this is an area where, in fact, the need for outside assistance in a sort of classic development terms may not be as necessary? No, it is not the necess necessary question. These people are, you know, everything they do differently has a price. They are paying the price either with their lives or with their lack of food or with their wrong type of water, wrong timing of water yeah. and uh, the wrong quality of water that they need to get. And all that, they are paying a price. Those who are responsible i.e. the rich, particularly of the rich countries from the Industrial Revolution onward who are getting benefits of these and are not paying the price of externalizing or throwing the cost of this carbon loading in the atmosphere, greenhouse gas increase, which is really causing the problem of global warming, they're not paying for that, but the poor are paying not necessarily with their cash, but with their lives and livelihoods. You know, herds of cattle are dying in Africa, People in Pakistan were thoroughly displaced. One year gone, still they have not got the place. The cyclone victims of the coastal area of Bangladesh, they still haven't got their houses back. They're living in shanties or on the roadside, still after two years after the cyclone has happened. So they are paying. But to say that they don't understand or they don't need any support would be one of the cruelest jokes 
that we can play on them. You, ma you mentioned Bangladesh, obviously, <laughs> since we're here. And the minister opening, uh, not, uh, not opening, but speaking at the opening ceremony this morning said Bangladesh is not one of the most vulnerable countries to vulnerable to climate change on earth. It is the most vulnerable country. Do you think that's true? Well, uh, we have calculations which, where we can show that Bangladesh is, at least it has, you know, uh, 10 big vulnerabilities out of which seven we call local, localized vulnerabilities and three general or, you know, overall vulnerabilities. Now, if we add them up, the highest number of people that are being impacted over a multiple causes is in Bangladesh. Of course, there are countries like Maldives, like some of the small islands, who will disappear altogether. Now, that is tragic as it is, but if you add the 48 small island developing states who are extremely threatened by climate change, the total number of population is far less than the biggest island in the coastal area of Bangladesh, which is Bola. So it's a, it's a question of whether you are, want to take a human-centric view of this. If you do, then Bangladesh comes out that way. But as in Cancun, this was discussed, and one of the, the Indian environment ministers said it's not a beauty contest. You don't have to say who is the most vulnerable. They're all vulnerable. But vulnerability for Bangladesh is definitely one of the most intense and tragic stories of human civilization from the you know creation of the ecological processes and the definitely after the industrial revolution as we know it mm. let, let me uh, something you said at the opening can i quote it back at you yes. uh, you said uh, we're on a development path climate change is going to suppress that development path what what did you mean by that well uh, say we have a i mean very crudely, the economist jargon of, uh, you know, GDP, uh, growth, per capita growth of the economic product or the domestic product. Now, if that path has to be followed, climate change comes and contributes to stopping the development path going in the way they were supposed to be going. Let me take, give you an example. Suppose we were planning, Bangladesh has a population growth rate which has decreased, decreased significantly, thanks to the large number of non-literate women who have made this dramatic historical decision. Never in the history of mankind has there been such a decrease in population growth rate with such a low level of nutrition. People are not getting their nutrition right. They're not eating enough. Still, they're growing, uh, decreasing the population growth rate. When that happens, plus a large number of indicators which show that Bangladesh is developing or continue to progress, climate change through its destabilization of the coastal area, intrusion of salt water due to sea level rise, enhanced number of cyclones and the intensity and frequency of, of that cyclone. There was a cyclone four years ago called Sida which has a velocity of 274 km per hour wind velocity, which is unthinkable. It is like a 274 km per hour truck coming and hitting you. So, and huge number of people lost their lives, but Bangladesh has a fantastic cyclone preparedness program, which has reduced the uh, death rate, the mortality rate, but the morbidity, the, the, the uh, misery of the people, that continues. Many people who have displaced, been displaced, lost their houses, lost everything, they have not come back, I mean, in the economic system. So, overall, economy is not progressing the way it could, without, that would happen otherwise without climate change. The point I was making is that this is the time to do planned adaptation. We have to plan this all together, the country as a whole, communities are doing it, the governments must start doing it. Scientists must learn how to use their knowledge better in helping the communities do better. So all these are elements of that progress, economic progress, which is being retarded by the impact of climate change. Now, if, if I were to, if I would have the opportunity to plan this, the way I would do it is not just the compensating the bit 
that has come. So if there is a baseline, we are growing like in a certain, you know, 5% growth rate. Climate change forces us to be 3% growth rate. I would rather get 8% growth rate, which is com having compensated this, I would do even better. Taking the opportunity of planning, taking the opportunity of social mobilization, taking the opportunity of educating people, taking the opportunity of growing more food. So science will enable us to do that better. It's not always going to be easy, but that is what I meant by overcoming the development problems that we have suppressed by climate change. Okay, I, and although we're here, the, the focus of this, of this meeting is adaptation, but I, I, I think I must ask you about mitigation, about actually curbing emissions. And that looks rather bleak to, to many observers, sure. to me among them. <laughs> um, do you think there is a chance, a, a realistic chance? I don't know, how, are you optimistic that we can actually shift away from these carbon spewing economies into yeah. something better for the atmosphere? Um, unfortunately, there are not signs yet of doing that. Uh, we had the various meetings, annual meetings of the Conference of Party that goes on. I have been involved in this prior to the inception of the climate convention. I was one of the people trying to write that convention. And we found the unjust nature of this convention right from the beginning. For example, we wanted a right to development for everybody. And the rich countries said, oh, that is not a right, you know, because they have solved that right for themselves. They won't give that to others. So that hasn't happened. So we were upset about that. Not only that's just an example. Many things that the convention did not create. But the convention had some elements that the greenhouse gas, which is causing the problem, will be reduced. Now that hasn't happened. Kyoto was an example as an initial preliminary primitive state to start doing that. Now, as we all know, United States, the richest country in the world, with the highest defense budget and invading any other country they choose, the, you know, could not get themselves to do the minimum humanitarian human rights issue, which is climate change. The greatest human rights issue now in the world is climate change, because it is the rights of the poor which has been taken away for their ordinary, you know, business as usual survival. They're, they're losing that because of the impacts of climate change which is happening all over the world, and the cause remains to be the rich of the rich countries. And they promised to do it. Never in the history of mankind have we done much about some of the global injustices that went on. There was slavery. We have not persecuted anybody for slavery. There's colonialism. We have not persecuted anybody for colonialism. But the climate change was an agreement where the rich countries voluntarily agreed to reduce their greenhouse gas to the level of 1990 and reduce it further soon after. Have they not only done it, they kept on increasing the greenhouse gas loading on the atmosphere which is impacting uh, the poor countries. Things will start changing when this impact starts transferring itself to richer countries. Let me give you an example. Australia has, is now spending quite a lot on adaptation because the Australia is feeling the pinch of their drought. Mm. Their, the Australian cities are only on the coasts. They are feeling the floods for the first time. United States will do so, feel these pretty soon, mm. not many decades away, and they will start changing those opinions. By that time, the tremendous um, degradation of the human condition of the developing countries would have already been done. So it is a competition against time where we have the choice of getting it right, reducing the greenhouse gas. Now adaptation you can keep on doing as much as you want, but there is a limit. Yeah. And the limit is when your ecosystem has collapsed or the human society, human system cannot function anymore in a given ecosystem. That is the limit, you have to be displaced. And one of the consequences of that is there will be huge displacement in millions and hundreds of millions of people. And now what we are talking about is, you know that clean development mechanism is a way coming from mitigation, reduce so much carbon, for that you can get paid so much. So it's carbon against money. What we are talking about 
very soon there will be carbon against human beings. So there will be, because you have spewed that much of carbon from the United States or Switzerland or Germany or Sweden, you'll have to take so many million people from the countries from which the displacement takes place. That's not going to be fun for either side, but that's the reality we are heading for. Mm, okay, well from that rather huge overview, rather a grim possibility, likelihood? Uh, of, of reducing? Not yet. No. I think the uh, OECD countries, the rich countries, needs a dose of civilization. Uh, well, that may be a little way off. Yeah. Okay, what about here? Back in Dhaka, we've had, this is one small attempt to tackle one aspect of the problem on adaptation. Day one, what, any impressions from the day? Yes. First of all, um, I think it has been greatly successful. One of the, you know, uh, targets we set was whether there was a, uh, enough of interaction between people coming from different, this is an integration of different communities. Here there are people from disaster risk reduction people, the people from agriculture, water, uh, forestry, fisheries, the people from planning side of uh, things, economic valuation, trying to find the me me metrics, I mean measurement of uh, indicators of adaptation. There are people who are talking about fund mobilization, fund management. So different types of people are they talking to each other to get a microcosm of integration that we need to solve this big problem. If from that perspective, the Prime Minister of Bangladesh, who has been a key leader in the negotiation process, was present here to open the uh, first inaugural session. The Minister of Environment of Bangladesh, who was here, was one of the key people in Cancun, trying to negotiate the finance part of it. So, and there was a huge number of uh, policy makers from all over the world. So, in that sense, yes, we have uh, made a success, a good start. I hope by end of the meeting, we'll get a bit better. Okay, thank you very much and uh, tonnebat. Thank you.